So today we're porting the F out of the 4AFE cylinder head. But the letter F in the title of this video doesn't mean what you think it means. It's not the naughty F word. It's the F in the 4AFE. And today we'll try to get rid of the F as much as possible. As you probably know, F in Toyota's engine codes stands for an economy head, while G stands for a performance-oriented cylinder head. As you can see, I'm starting by working on the combustion chambers. This is the only area of the cylinder head that I will be slightly reshaping, while everything else will mostly be just removal of casting flash and smoothing out rough surfaces, sharp angles and edges that are a consequence of the mass production process. When it comes to porting and polishing in general, the greatest gains are actually achieved at this early stage of removing mass production imperfections. Everything beyond that point brings about dramatic reduced gains and mostly serves to push the power band into higher RPMs. Some people think that the more you port, the more you enlarge the cross section of the ports, the more horsepower you gain. In reality, extreme port jobs only benefit all out racing and motorsport engines that spend most of their life at full throttle and close to the red line. When it comes to all other applications, too much porting does more harm then good. As you can see, I'm working with a carbide burr. If you're completely new to porting, I recommend using only cartridge rolls like these ones. They remove material much slower than carbide burrs, but are much safer and less likely to damage something on your cylinder head. Carbide burrs are great because they remove material very quickly, but they can sometimes hop away or bounce off from the head and this can damage your valve seats or other critical areas. This is why I prefer to use carbide burrs with smaller die grinders that are easier to control and hold in your hand. I use two die grinders so I can quickly switch between cartridge rolls and carbide burrs. I do the rough shaping with carbide burrs and finalize with cartridge rolls. When it comes to the combustion chamber, I will be devoting most of the attention to the area around the intake valves. And my goal here is to de-shroud the intake valves to a reasonable degree to improve flow. I am building a turbo engine and my goal is to make 300 horsepower from 1.6 liters of displacement. In stock form, the intake valves are set deep into the combustion chamber and are shrouded by the material of the combustion chamber. And although this does improve tumbling of the air-fuel mixture and efficiency, as well as air velocity and low RPM behavior, it doesn't help with making power at higher RPMs. If you look at a typical pen-truth combustion chamber in a performance-oriented cylinder head, you will notice that the intake valves are almost never shrouded and are given as much room to breathe as possible. And while it is impossible to completely reshape my combustion chamber into a performance one, I can open up the intake valves a bit and give them more room to breathe. You might be wondering why I don't completely remove all of this extra meat in the combustion chamber and try to create a sort of a hemispherical shape. Well, the reason is that removing too much material from the combustion chamber would result in too much combustion chamber displacement and too low of a compression ratio. The second reason is that it would likely completely kill low RPM responsiveness and move my power band too high in the RPM range. My goal is to make 300 horsepower from this economy engine, but I likely won't be driving at that power too much. My plan is to have maps switchable on the fly and have several different setups, most of which will be lower boost and a lower power, which are realistically better suited to the ancient MR2 Mark I chassis. There's also a high chance that in the second stage of my build, I will downgrade to a small, very fast response turbo, as I think that low and mid RPM play a critical role in the real world. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Here you can see the before and the after of the area around the intake valves. 
As you can see, I have not dramatically changed the shape of the combustion chamber, but simply made the original anatomy a bit more performance oriented. Although I don't have a full bench and can't prove my theory, I'm pretty confident that even this much will negatively impact my low and mid RPMs to some degree, but I must sacrifice a bit of low RPM in the interest of power. When it comes to the rest of the combustion chamber, I won't be doing anything dramatical. On the sides of the chambers, I'll just smooth things out and get rid of any sharp edges. A sharp edge inside a combustion chamber is a potential hotspot, so smoothing them out can reduce the likelihood of knock, and it's always a good idea to do this in a performance-oriented forced induction build. I am removing less material from the area around the exhaust valves as exhaust valves can actually benefit from being shrouded a bit and this can help promote faster gas exit. This is why on most engines exhaust valves are actually further apart from each other and closer to the edges of the combustion chamber when compared to the intake valves. Unlike the intake charge, the exhaust gases are actually exiting the chamber and the goal is to get them out of the chamber as fast as possible. In layman's terms, when the piston pushes up, less room around the exhaust valves gives exhaust gases sort of less space to dance around and the tighter space forces them out of the chamber faster. This is of course an oversimplification, but you get the idea. So that's pretty much it when it comes to the combustion chambers. The final stage for the chambers will include precise measuring of the displacement and equalizing the displacement of all chambers, after which I will polish them up a bit to try and help prevent carbon buildup from sticking to the chambers. But this will be the subject of a future video. Now we're getting back to porting. Next we're going to be focusing on the intake ports. As I said, there will be no extreme porting here, but I will definitely be gasket matching because as you can see here, there's pretty massive mismatch between the intake gasket and the port. This hurts performance and matching in a case like this can even help a bone stock engine, as this is a relatively significant obstacle in the path of the incoming air. As before, the carbide burr removes the excess metal and the cartridge rolls smooth and blend the surfaces into one. The 4AFE head also has significant casting flash throughout the entire intake port and removing this is an absolute must for any porting job. Compared to the 4AG heads, the 4AFE heads have significantly more casting flash in almost all areas. The 4AFE intake ports are pretty long and narrow, so you'll need a long die grinder attachment to reach all the areas of the intake port. I also like to wrap the handle or the stem of the attachment in a few layers of masking tape, because the attachment itself, when rotating at high speed, can do a lot of damage if it hits the gasket sealing area of the port. I'm working with an 80 grit roll here, but I finish things off by hand in 150 grit to provide a more uniform finish throughout the port. Here's some before and after shots of the intake ports. Our next area of focus is going to be the intake valve bowls. Compared to the port, which is a low risk area, the bowl is a high risk area. The seats on this head are good and I want to save them, but I can't use old valves to protect the seats here for obvious reasons, so maximum care and concentration is needed when working the bowl. One hit to the valve seat usually means that you must replace the seat. And this is an added unnecessary cost as well as risk because not all machine shops can properly execute a valve seat replacement. On top of this, most aftermarket valve seats are inferior to OEM ones and I'm not sure if OEM seats are still available for this head. When it comes to the bowl, measurable performance gains can be made here without any sacrifice of the whole end. As you can see, the factory did try to blend the seat into the bowl to some extent, but this is far from ideal and there are significant imperfections in the bowl area. Our goal here is to remove casting flash and basically completely blend the seat into the bowl. Both the short and the long radius of the port are very important and the entire circumference of the valve seat must be blended into the port. Here's some before and after shots so you can better see what I'm actually talking about.
Something else I decided to do since I'm working on the set is to remove the very significant casting flash in the valve train area. This much casting flash can almost never be found on a 4 AGE cylinder head, and although removing this casting flash will have zero performance benefits, uh, in theory it should help with the oil return in this head. Uh, I honestly doubt that removing this casting flash will have measurable oil return gains. Uh, I still couldn't leave it alone because it's so ugly, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity to get rid of it since I, I have the head in front of me and uh, the die grinders and attachments ready. Our final area of focus are the exhaust ports. The old exhaust gasket left some very convenient traces behind so we can see exactly how much extra material needs to be removed to match the gasket to the port. Again, there's a significant mismatch here and getting rid of it will benefit pretty much any engine. Although the benefits to doing this are much less noticeable on the exhaust side as the gases rush past this mismatch instead of hitting it as they do on the intake. The rest is pretty much the same as with the intake ports. Blend everything, get rid of rough surfaces and casting flash. When it comes to the exhaust ports, I have hand finished them in 240 grit sandpaper. Exhaust ports like a smoother finish to help the exit of the gases, while a slight roughness on the intake ports is beneficial to help the atomization of the air-fuel mixture. Here's some before and after shots of the exhaust ports. The valve bowls on the exhaust side are even worse than the ones on the intake and there's a lot of mismatch and casting flash to be removed. The challenge is that the exhaust valves are pretty small so there's even less room to move the die grinder around and it's very easy to hit the valve seat if you're not careful. I actually did touch the valve seat a bit for a split second, uh, I did very minimal damage and I'm not sure if a replacement will be necessary but I will leave that uh, to the machine shop to decide. The short radius of the exhaust bowls has some pretty weird angles and needs to be blended in quite a bit to make sense. A little tip for areas like this that are difficult or risky to access uh, with a die grinder is to cut a strip of sandpaper and drag it back and forth until you smooth out the target area. It does take more time, but it's zero risk. And here's the before and after of the exhaust bowls. And that's pretty much it. A lot of this really is common sense. You simply visualize the path of the air and try to make the surface as simple and as aerodynamic as possible to help the air flow faster and in greater quantity. Porting alone cannot transform a head or bring massive horsepower gains. Instead, it works in conjunction with other mods to help make the most of them. In other words, the real goal of porting and polishing is to prevent the imperfections left behind by mass production from reducing the benefits of your modifications. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4H app.